So it is my pleasure to introduce you another special, our speaker from the Munich Quantum Center, Professor Menno Port. He has kindly agreed to join us for this conference and give a plenary talk on integrated optomechanics and linear optics quantum circuits. Please join me in welcoming very warmly Professor Menno Port from Munich Quantum Center. Okay, thank you for this very kind introduction and also very uh, many thanks for the uh, invitation to be here. I think this is going to be a really wonderful workshop, uh, two days forward, very interesting talks. So in my group at uh, TU Munich, we design, simulate and make chips for quantum science and technology and we do that using advanced nanofabrication uh, techniques. And of course, once we have these, we also measure these. But this, uh, this research is not possible without the funding, so I also want to thank the funding agencies, the Institute of Advanced Studies, the Munich Quantum Center, and in particular, the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology, that is uh, an excellence uh, cluster started uh, in January, and that has really been instrumental in the development of our group. So in particular, what we do, as you probably have guessed from the title, is we focus on two main, uh, main topics. First of all, we work on integrated quantum optics, and secondly, we work on optomechanics. So uh, in case you read the abstract, we also do a little bit of uh, 2D optomechanics, but today I will not talk about that uh, because of, um, uh, uh, of the time. So I'll focus on things that are on chips, integrated quantum optics and on-chip optomechanics. So maybe you're wondering, well, how do we actually get light on and off our chips? And for that, I want to introduce to you these devices called grading couplers. So here you see the grading, uh, you can see very nicely. The green stuff here is silicon nitride, our favorite material. Here the blue material is, um, is silicon dioxide, the cladding material. And when we place an optical fiber above this grading, send light onto the grading, then with the right conditions we can actually guide the light onto the chip and then into the waveguide that is going to continue here and we can use that light. So now the simplest device that you can think of will be to have a waveguide, go along the chip, then go to another grading coupler, and then we can now measure with a second fiber how much light is transmitted through this device. And we can do that while we are scanning our chip underneath this, uh, this fiber array that we have. So when we do that, we get a measurement like this, where you see the X position and the Y position of our chip. In the color scale, we have the uh, detected power on the logarithmic scale. And then you can see there are these things here, which are the higher orders of the uh, diffraction of the grading. But then here we see there's a very bright, uh, very light uh, spot here. And that means that there is an optimal spot where we have a pretty high transmission from the fiber onto our chip, and then from the chip back into the fiber to the detector. That is about one by one micrometer. And that, of course, sounds as if it's very, very small and very difficult to align. But actually, we can do that very well. So here I show you a, a microscope image of one of our chips. And as you can see, usually we're not so much interested in doing just a single device. No, we typically have hundreds of devices on our chips. And to measure all of these, we actually developed automated measurement procedures. So imagine we have now been measuring this device that is hidden underneath this fiber array here. And then we uh, press enter and then actually completely automated, we have the chip moving to the next device. And then, of course, this takes a, a few seconds. Once it finds some transmission to this device, it's going to optimize it by moving forward in the perpendicular direction, moving back and forth in the original direction, and then it finds the maximum. Now we're ready to do our measurements on that particular device. In this, uh, these simple devices, it is measuring the transmission as a function of wavelength. In our optomechanical devices, we will be measuring responses, quality factors, thermal motion. But when we're done, uh, the measurement simply continues. And we can measure all these hundreds of devices on our chip, fully automated, at least if everything goes well. And uh, how are we doing then in terms of this finding this one by one micron spot? Well, here you see now a histogram of approaching a single device on a chip 100 times, measuring how much light we actually get through. And then maybe it's not so obvious from 
this histogram, but you see we actually have a mean value of about 10 microwatts, but the standard deviation is only about 0.3% of that value, meaning we can do this really reproducibly and really controlled in a very automated fashion, meaning now we can not only do our measurements on individual devices, but we can also use these transmissions to, uh, to do quantitative measurements, which is very important, for example, in our work on directional couplers. So now that we uh, know how to get light on and off our chip, we can see what we can do with that. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll introduce to you our very versatile optomechanical device called the H-resonator. We use that for phase shifting, but also to do optomechanics experiments. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll switch gears and tell you about our linear optics quantum uh, circuits, where we use photons as qubits and circuits as operations. And I'll tell you our progress towards a fully scalable, integrated, controlled knot circuit. But let's start with the optomechanics. So I think we have now a very diverse group of people here in this room. So I first want to explain to you what do we actually mean with optomechanics. Well, optomechanics is the field where people use light to measure and to alter the dynamics of a mechanical resonator. A mechanical resonator can be almost anything because they can range from this kilometer long gravitational wave detectors where there are very heavy mirrors that weigh kilograms and that are moving at a few hertz a uh, few times per second, all the way to these nanofabricated devices that have masses of just a few femtogram and oscillate uh, at gigahertz rates. So there's a huge uh, span of different uh, length scales, masses, and frequencies involved. And we can see a clear trend that if you make your devices smaller, they become lighter and they move faster. However, what all these devices have in common is that the sensitivities with which we can read out the position of any of these mechanical resonators is typically expressed in terms of femtometers per square root hertz. So maybe you think, well, that's a little bit of a funny unit. What does it mean? Well, this number basically tells us that if you give me one second to find out what the position is of any of these resonators here, then I can find the position of that resonator with a size that is smaller than the size of the nucleus of an atom. So optomechanics is extremely sensitive. So in our group, we not only work on optomechanics. So uh, when I uh, was at Yale, I learned a lot about optomechanics. But before that, I was at TU Delft and did a lot of work on electromechanics. So one of the topics that we work on is to combine optomechanics with nanoelectromechanics. And maybe you're asking yourself, well, why do you want to do that? Because optomechanics is already so great. Well, I already told you that optomechanics has extremely good sensitivity because we have very low noise lasers and also the detectors that we can use can detect single photons and they are quantum limited. So optomechanics is for that reason extremely sensitive. However, there's also a little bit of a challenge there. That is that photons interact only very weakly with the mechanical resonator. And that is illustrated with this cartoon uh, here in the bottom left, where you uh, see a fire Perot cavity. This mirror here is connected with a spring to the fixed world. And when we send light in there, we have, of course, the light bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. And every time when a photon actually hits this mirror, it re reverses direction, thereby transferring twice its momentum to that mirror. But the momentum of such a single photon is actually tiny. It's about 10 to the minus 28 in SI units for the wavelengths that we're using. So the forces in optomechanics are typically rather small. So in contrast, we also have nanoelectromechanics. And there, the sensitivity is rather low, unless you use special devices, such as single uh, uh, electron transistors or superconducting quantum interference devices. But the nice thing there is that the, um, we can make use of the very strong electrostatic forces. And here, that is illustrated with uh, a cartoon of a carbon nanotube that is suspended above a gate electrode. You see all the electric field lines here. And now, when you make this separation smaller and smaller, the force becomes uh, stronger and stronger. And that is why we typically want to work with nano-electromechanical devices in contrast to the much larger micro-electromechanical devices. So these are, of course, two cartoons. How do we uh, implement this in practice? Well. As I said, the first thing that we want is we want to have a very sensitive readout from um, the optomechanics. So for that, we want to use an on-chip Max Zender interferometer. We also want to have very strong forces. So we want to uh, place electrodes on that resonator with nanometer uh, separation so that we can use the strong electrostatics there. 
And also we're interested in doing optomechanics, so we also want to have a very high quality factor for uh, our mechanical devices, meaning if you have some oscillations and you turn off the driving force, we will see still many, many oscillations before they finally die out. So those uh, are three important aspects. And uh, when we looked at this, we came to the conclusion that the best way <laughs> forward is to actually make the resonator and also the integrated photonic circuits out of high stress silicon nitride and then use uh, liftoff processes to add metal electrodes there. And maybe the first thing that comes to mind if you then uh, look at these two things here was simply to make a beam, place some, uh, some gold on top, put another fixed electrode nearby and then maybe you're ready to go. But unfortunately there's a problem that is in this case the metal will absorb all the different uh, all the light and the whole thing will go crazy and heat up. So what we have to do we have to separate the actuation part with the metal and the readout part that sees the light. So a little bit like this so we have those things separated and then we have a little block that connects those two uh, areas here and this is what we call the H resonator because just like the letter H it has these four arms where the structure is tethered and then there's the center part over here. So uh, of course this is now a mechanical structure it can have many different eigen modes but for most of this talk I will be focusing on the fundamental in-plane mode where this entire structure is moving back and forth and it's being held by these four arms where there are the clamping points. So an actual device looks like this. So this is one of the devices, one of the many devices on, uh, on a single chip. As you can see, device is pretty large. So if you have good eyes, you can actually see for yourself on, uh, on the chip what it looks like. And you probably al rec already recognize, here we have a grading coupler that we use to send light into this waveguide. Here the waveguide splits into two parts. This is the reference arm of the Maxander interferometer. This is the other arm. Here it combines and then we can actually see how much light is being transmitted. So that is uh, what we have here. We send the light in here and look what comes back on this other port. Of course the really interesting stuff happens over here. So let's zoom in what we have there. That's where we have the mechanical device where you see um, here in, uh, in green the mechanical structure. We have the waveguide through which the light uh, travels. That's this arm here. We also see the yellow uh, regions. Uh, those are the electrodes that we use to apply the voltages. And even although this device looks pretty big, you can even see it with the naked eye if you look very careful, the gap here is only 100 to 150 nanometers wide. So this is really a very uh, big challenge to fabricate uh, these devices in the clean room using advanced nanofabrication techniques and also the photonic crystal has nanometer sized uh, dimensions. So nanofabrication is an important aspect here. So this is now a picture of uh, the device again and I want to point out that even although we developed this device initially with optomechanics experiments in mind, we also always keep an eye open for technology. So we also realized that this device could also serve as a very uh, useful device in photonics, that is to make it a phase shifter. So how would that work? Well, the idea is that we have our electrodes and we can apply a voltage between these electrodes, thereby putting charge on both sides. There's an electric field, so these charges will be attracted, resulting in a force on our mechanical resonator. This force, of course, is going to displace the entire structure, changing thereby the gap between the waveguide to which the uh, light travels and the mechanical structure. And now what happens is that if you look at the effective refractive index of the light propagating through this waveguide, then you see that it actually depends on the separation between the waveguide and this uh, mechanical structure. And when the light has propagated along this uh, structure, it accumulates different phases depending on the position of the resonator. So in other words, we are changing the phase. So that is how this device acts as a phase shifter. But you probably know there are more devices that can, um, can shift phases in particular using the uh, electro-optic effect or the thermo-optic effect. So the big benefit is that this device is electrostatic in nature. We apply a voltage, but in static operation no current is flowing, meaning no power is dissipated. So if you have many of these devices on a chip, they're not going to talk to each other, unlike if you have thermo-optic uh, phase shifters. And this also makes them ideal for cryogenic operation. And in case you're wondering why is that important, well, I think that will become clear in the second part of my talk. <laughs>
So this device also simply has a waveguide here, so it does not rely on a cavity. So in principle, we can send a very wide wavelength range of light through here, and we still get uh, phase shifts. Also, since there's no cavity, the optical forces are really small, meaning we can send single photons through this waveguide, but also up to watts of power. And I think, um, actually, we would first start to burn the waveguide, and uh, other bad things would happen before this device would stop working. So also, we have a huge range of powers that we can uh, send through this device. And finally, since we are using silicon nitride, which is actually a very highly stressed material, the eigenfrequencies of these uh, devices are very high, meaning we can also operate these devices very rapidly. So how does that work? Well, first of all, what we can do is we can measure the transmission through our device, through our Maxander interferometer, and then we get um, a curve that looks like this. The overall shape that you see here, the envelope, is given by the transmission of the grading coupler. And then on top of that, you see these uh, fringes here. These are the uh, fringes from the unbalanced uh, Maxander interferometer. So this is now at zero volt. But as I uh, said, we can actually use the voltage to change this phase in this upper arm here. And thereby, if we now go to uh, five volts, then you see that these uh, fringes have shifted. And this shift in fringes is exactly this phase shift that we are looking for. So now what we can do is we can actually extract and follow what this phase shift uh, does as a function of voltage. And then we get a plot uh, like what we see over here, where we have applied voltage and the resulting phase shift. We see a very nice quadratic phase shift with applied voltage. And that is because the electrostatic force is proportional to voltage squared. It is always attractive. And actually, in this very first generation of devices, we have shown already more than 90 degree phase shift. But of course, we have in the meantime also uh, improved on these, uh, on these numbers. And now uh, we are much closer to uh, actually above 180 degree phase shifts. And of course, nothing prevents us from cascading that and reaching full 360 degrees phase shifts. So this, of course, apply a voltage, wait a little while, and then see what happens. So what uh, do we learn if we are going to look at the dynamic performance of these devices? So for that, we don't apply just a static voltage. No, we also apply a sinusoidal actuation and measure the resulting phase shift. So that is then shown uh, in this plot here. So we see that um, the device operates to a few megahertz. The 3 dB point is around uh, 1 megahertz uh, over here. And actually, we've shown that we could use this device to make sub uh, microsecond uh, pulses, which is, of course, also very interesting if you want to do fast actuation, feed forward, feed backward, and so on. Um, and But you also see there's a number of peaks here. And these peaks actually correspond to the different mechanical modes of the structure. So uh, as you can imagine, this is the fundamental mode. Here we have another mode where uh, the motion is mainly localized on the arms which have the metal on top. Here the motion is mainly localized on the other arms that don't have the metal. And then you have higher and higher modes. So when you look at these modes, you see there is a certain width here. And from that, we can extract the quality factor. And for this device, the quality factor is around 10 if we measure it in air. And to be honest, um, if uh, you would have asked us, well, for the phase shifting here, we wouldn't mind if the quality factor was even lower, because that means that this response curve would be even smoother. So there we wouldn't mind. Um, but for optomechanics experiments, this is, of course, completely useless. But as anyone can tell you, um, if you work with air, then you have viscous damping. So get rid of the air. In other words, put this device in vacuum. And then what happens is that the quality factor increases dramatically. And you can see that now, if we go to vacuum, we have quality factors up to 300,000 for this particular device. And then you can really start to do optomechanics experiments. So, uh, here, I want to show you three different things. And in particular, I'll first talk about the electrostatic uh, effects that we have. So in this case, we have, of course, these electrodes. So we can now see what happens with the frequency of our mechanical device if we apply different electrostatic voltages to this uh, device. So here, you see the applied voltage. Here, you see the frequency response. And this orange thing here, that is the fundamental in-plane resonance. This resonance here is actually the fundamental out-of-plane resonance. I won't talk too much about that. But you can see very clearly that this uh, in-plane resonance moves down 
um, with the applied voltage. And actually, we can tune this by more than 25%. So with electrostatic actuation, we actually have a huge tuning range of this mechanical um, device. And also, we can drive this uh, thing. So here you see different driving levels. Here we have very low driving forces, minus 60 dBm, and you see a very nice symmetric peak here. If we now increase the driving force to, say, minus 45 dBm or even minus 30, you see there's a, uh, a peak that becomes nonlinear. But maybe the experts in the audience already know something, uh, realize something funny, namely that usually if you have a mechanical device, things become stiffer if you drive them harder because you have more motion, you induce more tension, and just like in a guitar string, the more tension you have, the frequency goes up. But here, actually, the frequency is going down. So it turns out that we also have a duffing parameter that is a nonlinearity that we can, uh, can tune using the electrostatic uh, forces. So what we do is we fit these response curves, extract the duffing parameter alpha, and then we get a plot like this. Again, we have a very nice parabola, but you see that at zero voltage, we get positive uh, values for this nonlinearity. That is the intrinsic mechanical nonlinearity that we know so well, where the resonator is stiffening for higher amplitudes. However, if we go now to larger voltages, then you see we actually cross over, the, we have a downward parabola, we go to negative values, where in this case the device is actually weakening. So now depending on our application, we can choose different operation points. For example, here if we want to have a stiffening spring, here if we want to have a weakening spring, and if we go to the sweet spot here, actually we have hardly any duffing nonlinearity. In other words, for this red curve here, you see at the same driving level, we have a very nice symmetric peak here, meaning we can actually use this to increase the dynamic range of this uh, mechanical device a lot. And that's, of course, very important for applications where you may want to use this as, uh, as tunable filters or other things where it uh, is very nice to have a larger dynamic range. So also what you see here is that we are measuring a few tens of nanometers for these devices. And maybe you think, well, nanometers, that's extremely small, right? But actually for us, it is huge. So we can do a lot better. We can measure much, much smaller motions. And also one thing uh, to keep in mind, that in the previous experiments, we were actively driving this resonator, really shaking it hard and seeing what it's doing, how it is responding. But even if we don't drive it actively, this resonator is not standing still at all. So ultimately, there will be the quantum motion, the zero-point motion of this device, which would be about 3.5 femtometers. But to reach that, we would have to cool this device to 40 microkelvin, and that is, of course, going to be very challenging. So um, in this case, we also have the thermal motion, which is about 14 picometer at uh, room temperature. And that is, of course, something that uh, we could try to resolve. So can we see that? Well. As you can see from this picture here, where we now measure the thermal uh, sort of spectrum, the noise spectrum, you can see there's a flat background here, which is the noise floor of our detector. And indeed, this is a few tens of femtometers per square root hertz. But then there is this very big peak here, and this is actually the Brownian motion, this 14 picometer that we can resolve with a signal to noise ratio of about 1,000, meaning in a time domain it would look something like this here. However, there is one little challenge here, and that is that the width of this peak is only a few hertz, in this case 13 hertz, meaning the dynamics, the interesting dynamics, takes place on a millisecond to second scale, whereas these oscillations take place on a megahertz scale. So what we uh, like to do now is to introduce the um, demodulation of the motion into quadratures. That is, we take these things here, where the x is the, uh, is the cosine component and the y quadrature will be the sine component. And then you can see that uh, here we are in phase with the x quadrature and with the y quadrature. So we have a positive value for y, zero value for x, whereas here we would have a negative value for x and a zero value for, uh, for y. And when we do that, we can actually see what the uh, resonator looks like in phase space. In other words, we can make histograms like this, where we now look at the, uh, the thermal motion, and you see it is a nice symmetric Gaussian um, uh, shape that we have in both x and y quadratures.
But now what we uh, can do is um, take this nice circular shape and actually squeeze it. So we're going to apply a modulation uh, frequency, uh, a pumping frequency at twice the resonance frequency with varying strength. And when we do that, we will actually take this circular shape and squeeze it, as it's called. So that is then uh, shown in the movie that I'm just uh, going to play here. So here you will see the pumping strength, which uh, is typically indicated with a chi, but in this case we actually apply different voltages, and we're going to see what this histogram, how this histogram is going to change. So now you see we inc increase the pumping, you see it actually becomes a little bit larger along this direction here, and actually it also becomes at the same time narrower and narrower in the x-direction. And when we now analyze these um, histograms um, in a little bit more detail, we can actually get the variance in the x direction and in the y direction. And you see that in this case, the y direction goes up, whereas the x direction, we actually reduce the amount of noise. And um, we can see that in this case, we actually reduce the amount of noise in the x quadrature, we squeeze it, uh, and maybe you think, well, can we not increase the pump any further? Unfortunately not, because at some point this uh, noise in the y quadrature uh, becomes unstable and you get oscillations. This means that the noise can only be squeezed in the x quadrature by a factor of 2, in other words, by 3 dB. And that's of course 50% less noise, always good, but we want to go much further than that. So is there a way? <coughs> well, the idea is that uh, this parametric squeezing reduces noise in one quadrature, but is limited due to the uh, instabilities in the other quadrature. There's also another way to reduce noise, and that is called feedback cooling. So in this case, you're taking a signal from your resonator, feed it back to it, and you also reduce the noise. But in this case, you're limited by the signal-to-noise ratio. And the idea uh, in these two uh, works is to uh, combine now these two techniques, to use squeezing, squeezing to reduce the noise, but feedback to actually prevent the instabilities. And in this case, we actually add another term here, which prevents the damping rate from becoming zero or even negative. So in this case, we no longer have a fundamental limitation to 3 dB, and we could in principle go on and on and on. So this is then a, a, a schematic of the experiment, where we have our resonator. You see it is driven by force noise, giving rise to the thermal motion here. But when we try to detect that, there's also the noise floor, as you can see here on this cartoon of the spectrum analyzer, that's this imprecision noise that we have. Here in green, we have the, uh, the modulation at twice the resonance frequency that is going to squeeze the motion. So instead of this one, we will get something like that. But then you also see the schematic here in blue, and this is the feedback that we do on the Y quadrature. That's the one that was unstable. So how does that work? Well, here we now see a measurement where we plot the normalized variance when we only apply squeezing. And then this is basically the same as we saw in the movie. You uh, actually um, decrease the noise in the x quadrature, you increase the noise in the y quadrature, and at the point where the y quadrature becomes unstable, you reach this 3 dB squeezing limit. So that's the one element that we have. The other element is this uh, feedback on the y quadrature. So in this case, we do feedback cooling only on the y quadrature. You see nothing happens with the blue points here in the x quadrature, but you see this is going down and at some points going up, limited by the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And you can also see that we understand really well what's going on because the theory curve fits the data very nicely. And now the thing will be to combine both of these. So we know that here there's the feedback uh, cooling limit, about 12 dB for our signal-to-noise ratio. Can we beat that? Well, first what we did, we applied this uh, feedback gain of 7 volt per volt and then repeated this experiment here. And when we did that, we found these uh, curves here. And then you can see we start to increase the pump more and more and more and more. And we go down and down and down. We hit the 3 dB limit and nothing happens. We just keep on going down, 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 down until we reach this point here. And then still the y quadrature becomes um, unstable and we actually beat this 3 dB squeezing limit. But in case you're wondering, this is of course a little bit silly because now we reach here a point where we reduce the amount of noise in the x quadrature that was the same as what we already did for the y quadrature without any pump. So that's of course not gaining us uh, so much. We could just have done this y feedback and then not apply any pump. So can we do better than that? 
Well, if we now go to this region here, where we are actually heating up our Y quadrature already because of the limited signal-to-noise ratio, and repeat the experiment, then you see, again, we start here, we go down, 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 and then at some point this one becomes unstable, but also here we now go much, much further, and in this case we actually uh, reached about uh, 15 dB of squeezing. So this is, of course, already very far beyond the 3 dB limit, but also it surpasses this uh, feedback cooling limit. So this is, of course, uh, very nice, but it is all squeezing the thermal motion. So what about squeezing the quantum motion? So, um, of course, for that, uh, we would like to go to, uh, to see the zero-point motion. I already told it's about femtometers, so in principle we could resolve that, but uh, it is hidden by the thermal motion of the resonator. So the first thing to look at are now different uh, experimental uh, options. This is what we have, about well, half a megahertz, room temperature, meaning there is about 13 million uh, phonons, and we would have to squeeze by 74 dB. So I've shown you 15 dB, so that seems to be way out of reach. On the other hand, if we would have now a 1 gigahertz resonator at liquid helium temperatures, then there are only going to be 80 photons, uh, phonons left, and we would have to squeeze by 22 dB. So that seems something that is very reasonable. Of course, if we would take the same resonator and cool it down in the dilution refrigerator, then it would already be very close to its ground state, and we would actually have to squeeze by a very modest amount. So from this, it is clear that uh, lower temperatures and or higher frequencies are really the way to go. Of course, if you go to higher frequencies, there are challenges. If you go to lower temperatures, there's also challenges, but I think uh, we have shown that these are, in principle, uh, things that we can overcome. The real question is, are there any fundamental limits? Because maybe some of you have heard about the standard quantum limit that places limits to the signal-to-noise ratio that you can achieve in an optomechanical system. So here uh, we have a little bit complicated figure where we plot now the relative uh, variance. Um, we actually plot the strength of our detection. And when I uh, say strength of the detection, you can think of that as the power of our laser. So if we have a very weak laser, then uh, we will have a lot of imprecision noise because we will not be able to do very good readout. So in this case, we have lots of imprecision noise, and when we increase the amount of laser, you see the imprecision noise goes down. We can resolve smaller and smaller motions. In principle, here we would have the zero-point motion. That uh, is what we use to normalize it. If we are at higher temperatures, for example, at 4 Kelvin for this 1 gigahertz resonator, we actually have a lot more thermal motion here. So maybe you're thinking, well, why don't I just keep on increasing the laser power and we go down and down and can resolve smaller and smaller motion. But there's also a caveat, namely that these photons in the laser also impart forces on this resonator. And at some point, they're going to cause back action that's going to increase the motion of the resonator beyond the intrinsic zero-point motion that you had. And uh, there is um, now uh, this, uh, this sweet point here where you can... Uh, can get a signal to background ratio here at the standard quantum limit uh, that is um, uh, about a factor of two, where you can see that in this case you would have a spectrum where you have imprecision noise shown here. It is about one half of the zero point motion, but also you would already be heating your uh, resonator with this uh, back action uh, here. So this is what we call the standard quantum limit. That's the optimal point to operate this device if you don't do any feedback or squeezing. So if we now um, look at that, we see that uh, we, would not, uh, we would not be able to resolve this with a very high signal ba to background ratio, but still we would be able to resolve that. So this is now where we would start. This is where we want to go. So as you see, this is the amount of squeezing that is required. This was the 22 dB that I was uh, showing you before. So can we reach that? So here we see now a very similar uh, plot, the amount of uh, coupling to our detector, how far we have to go down. This is where we would reach quantum squeezing. This is without any pumping, and then you can see this is the curve that we get. If we now turn on the parametric pump, and of course also the stabilizing feedback, then we're going to increase the squeezing, and you see we go down, down, down. So by now having a pump strength of uh, about 1,000 times the line width, we would, uh, for this resonator, be in the quantum state. So here we would really go to about 8 dB of quantum squeezing for this uh, number here. So of course another question is, well, how robust is it? Is this experimentally feasible or not? 
Well, as I said, theoretically this is um, unlimited, but in practice there's also uh, always problems that the detuning is not entirely zero or that your feedback is not entirely right. So how robust is this uh, quantum squeezing? Well, that is uh, shown in this plot here, ideal case, same as this plot here. But now what happens if we say, well, we are detuned by accident, say one line width away, and about half a degree in our feedback angle, parameters that are very reasonable, then you can see at low signal-to-noise ratios, at low powers, this goes up and we no longer have squeezing, but still there's a pretty large area here, uh, shaded, where we, do have this, uh, sorry, where we do have this quantum squeezing still. So yes, this is definitely something uh, that we think is possible also in the, uh, in the quantum state. So another thing that we can do is um, to uh, tell a little bit more, not just about squeezing in, uh, in one particular direction, no, because that is something uh, that we uh, did before, that is linear feedback, but we can also do nonlinear feedback. In particular, we can look at the phase of this resonator in real time and then use that to stabilize it. And this, um, again, since we're working with classical states, uh, generates uh, these uh, very interesting looking uh, probability distribution functions that we call the number-like and the cat-like state. In the previous talk, you have seen uh, seen the real Wigner function. So this would be the Wigner function of a true single phone non-state and a true Schrodinger cat state. And of course, this is not something that we can observe with our thermal motion, but still it would be very interesting to apply the same techniques that we have, this nonlinear feedback to these kind of systems when they are in the quantum ground state. So that's definitely something that we are working on. So let me now switch gears and tell you a little bit about the second topic that is to tell you more about this linear optics quantum circuits where we use photons as qubits and circuits as operations. And the idea is that uh, we pursue this um, kind of research in the context of linear optics quantum computing where people uh, you say that uh, optical photons are ideal qubits. The reason for that is they hardly interact with their environment. And in particular, when you use optical fibers or free space, you can easily transfer them over large distances, and also the coherence of these photons will be very well preserved. However, as you know, not everyone is working on linear optics quantum computing. There's also a lot of other techniques that people use, and that's because there's also a number of challenges with this uh, approach. In particular, photons not only hardly interact with uh, their environment, they also hardly interact with each other. And this makes it um, very difficult to make two qubit gates. But fortunately, there's a solution for that. Also, these experiments are usually not very uh, scalable if you use free space optics, because soon, if you go beyond the proof of principle experiments, you'll be measuring your experiments in a number of optical tables or even a number of rooms that you would need to fill with all these different uh, mirrors and uh, beam splitters and so on. So it probably comes as no surprise that with our background, our approach is actually to use integrated optics, where we can make many small devices or components on a chip, and then as an added bonus, we don't have to worry about phase stability, where people here have to stabilize everything using uh, auxiliary lasers. In our case, we write our waveguides, everything is phase stable. So how does that work? Well, of course, as I said, optical photons are ideal qubits, so how do we encode quantum information on there? And there are many different ways. You can encode in the polarization of the qubit, you can use time bin, is the photon arriving now or a little bit later, in the energy, or the presence of a single photon or no photon. But in our case, when we use these waveguides, the most logical one is the so-called path encoding. And in this case, the logical quantum state 0 and 1 corresponds to the presence of a single photon in a waveguide. So here we see two waveguides, and now if we send a single photon in here, we say that's our state 0. If we send it in here, then that's our state 1. And that's, of course, the first step. However, to create an arbitrary state for our uh, qubit, that is this state here, how can we do that? Well, the very first step that we can do is to take a single photon and send it into this device called a Y-splitter. Then what we're going to get out is, of course, 50% chance to find a photon here or here, but only when we measure it. Before we do that, we actually see that we have this superposition state. So this Y-splitter creates a superposition state. So that's, of course, already the plus sign that we're looking for here. And the next element that we can do is make one of these paths a little bit longer than the other one, and then these will be slightly shifted in phase, and we have this state here, where now there's a phase difference between the two. 
And then the final ingredient that we still need is to control the relative amplitude of these, uh, of these probabilities. And then we actually get our desired single uh, qubit state. So this is just one example, but the take home message here is really that um, single qubit operations is basically just a design of simple photonic structures that we can do very well. So this is just a single qubit. How about building an optical quantum computer? Well, of course, then we will need many more qubits. And in this case, it will be many more waveguides. That's something we can easily do. Sending multiple photons in there is going to be much more challenging, of course. But uh, in principle, we know then that every operation that we can think of operating on single qubits, on n single qubits, can always be implemented again using simple photonic circuitry. The real challenge is to have photons interact with each other. And maybe the first thing to com that comes to mind is to use nonlinear optics, where you see that the electrical displacement not only depends on the electric field here, but has also this higher order terms, such as the Kerr effect, where the refractive index depends actually on the number of photons or the amount of light in this uh, waveguide. But unfortunately, this is uh, way too weak at the single photon level, uh, unless you go to very exotic uh, systems that, uh, that people are working with. So for a very long time, this was really a big obstacle, and people didn't really uh, think that these optical quantum computers would be feasible, until in 2001, there was a seminal paper by Neil Laflamme and Milburn, and they actually uh, showed that you could use a different way the, to use the so-called measurement-induced nonlinearity here. So I think this paper is really seminal. It contains many, many different uh, things that were uh, discovered by then. And I'm not going to go through all the details, but I do want to give you a little bit of a flavor about what is happening here. So the idea is that uh, we can have um, photons and propagate them through a linear network. So here you can see we have three different beam splitters. And the idea is now we encode one qubit in here, another qubit in this, uh, in this blue region. So now when we take a photon, send it into this waveguide, it goes to the beam splitter, and now it is actually transmitted. However, if we repeat this experiment, maybe the next time it will be reflected. That, of course, we don't really know. But we do know if it goes here, then it is no longer in our qubit, and it is lost. So what we can do is we can place detectors at the end, and if we realize that the experiment didn't go well, if the photon ended up, for example, here, then we uh, simply repeat the experiment and uh, we uh, continue. So actually, this simple photonic uh, network that I'm showing you here is already a two-qubit gate. This is the so-called conditional sign gate, where here you have a control qubit, and this is the target qubit. And when you work out all the mathematics, you see that uh, if you send in this, this, and this state, you're going to get exactly the same state back. But if you send in the state 1, 1, then you actually get a minus sign. So only this one picks up a minus sign. All the other ones have a plus sign. And that is exactly one of those two qubit gates that, uh, that you would need. Another thing that you see from this matrix is that there's a factor of 1 out of 9 standing in front. And this means that this is now a non-deterministic process. Sometimes things go wrong. Actually, a lot of times it goes wrong, and you have to repeat it. But fortunately, Neil, Laflamme, and Milburn in their paper also showed that if you now cascade this, still this is not going to decay exponentially um, with, um, uh, with the number of gates that you have, but it actually scales much better, and that this is actually a feasible, although not entirely obvious, but still a feasible approach to uh, quantum computing. So again, these are just uh, cartoons. How does it work in practice? Well, this is one of the uh, devices that we have on our chip. The structure here is about 1.5 by 1 millimeter in size. And actually, this implements a so-called controlled knot circuit. So this is another one of those two qubit gates. And the idea is that we're going to send pairs of single photons into these grading couplers here. And each of these photons encode one qubit. So we have two qubits. Then, of course, we have to initialize these qubits. And for that, we have the circuitry over here, where we actually use our H resonators as phase shifters. After we have initialized our two qubits in the desired state, then we're going to send them into our quantum circuit, which is in this case the C0 gate. And after that, we of course need to analyze what comes out. So we have tomography uh, circuits, which is basically the mirror image of what we have here for the analyzation. And remember, we are here working with single photons. And detecting single photons is not something that you can do very easily. So for that, we also have superconducting single photons on the same chip. 
So maybe most of you are more familiar with regular optics on optical tables than with photonics. So now I want to tell you a little bit a dictionary on how to go from things that you probably are very well aware of to things in photonics. And in particular, if we now consider one of these laser beams propagating here, then in our case, the light path will be replaced by a waveguide. Then if you have one of these nice mirrors here, where the, uh, the light uh, changes its direction, we simply have to bend the waveguide, and also we have the light traveling in a different direction. Lenses we don't need, because we can have single mode waveguides, so we don't have to care about the spatial profile. And another very important thing is what we have here, a little beam splitter cube. You'll see many of these in these experiments here. And in our case, that will be a so-called directional coupler. So these we have already seen, so let's focus a little bit on this particular element that we have here. So these beam splitter cubes um, are now directional couplers in our photonic implementation. So what is a directional coupler? Well, this is what it looks like. So we have two waveguides. This is a top view. We can send light into this waveguide here. And then when we bring this waveguide closer to the other one, you can see that a little bit of the light is going to leak out of this waveguide. And that starts to build up power in this other waveguide. And then when we propagate it, you see it builds up. And when we taper the two regions away from each other again, we still have a certain amount of light in this uh, waveguide here that goes through. But also we have a certain amount of light that crosses over. And that would be exactly the reflection and transmission of these little beam splitter cubes. So the big question is now, if we want to have, say, a 50-50 beam splitter, what kind of interaction length should we then choose for that uh, given splitting ratio. So for that, we made a lot of these devices where we send light in here, measure how much crosses over, how much goes through, and then we're going to change this interaction length. And when we do that and measure it, you see that here we have the amount of uh, light that crosses over. These are all different devices that have different lengths on them. And now we can fit that using the coupled mode theory. We get the two parameters L0 and LC out, the offset length and the coupling length. And with these values, we can actually design our next chip. So this is chip number one. We then use these values. We make chip number two. And then we get this uh, plot here, where the goal was to reach 50-50 and 67-33 beam splitters with uh, these interaction lengths. And then you can see that at the wavelength where our single photon source operates, we are actually very close to those values. So, uh, this is, of course, just a single directional coupler. So can we make more complex circuits? Well, this is now the C0 gate, where you can see this is kind of the controlled uh, sine gate, but then with two additional directional couplers here. And this is, of course, much more complex to, uh, to analyze. But fortunately, it has shown that if you know what the classical scattering matrix is of this linear system, then you can also uh, confirm that the quantum operation will be uh, done the right way. So how to find now this scattering matrix? Well, for that, we have, again, many different photonic devices where we make identical C0 gates, but now we connect different inputs and different outputs to each other and measure the transmission here. So here, this input is connected to input number one. The output is connected to number four here. So we measure this element of the transmission of the scattering matrix. And we can do that for 16 different combinations. And then the measurement looks something like this. So what is it supposed to look like? Well, the ideal case would be something like this. And you can see it looks very similar. So can we quantify that? Is this now good or is it bad? Well, for that, we can actually fit a model of our circuit to the experimental data. And from that, we get uh, values for the two beam splitters that are actually very, very close, just a few percent off from what you, uh, what you would expect. But still, is this any good? So we know these values are close to ideal, but is that good for the C0 or not? Well, in this case, we calculate the probability for uh, the right outcome as a function of these two beam splitter ratios. This is where you want to be at this very high case where you have 100% right outcome, and this is where we are. So you see that this circuit would give us 99.8% of the time the right uh, outcome. So this would be a really high fidelity C0 operation. So of course, now we have the C0. We need to do the um, uh, initialization in arbitrary states with a network that looks something like this. I've already told you 
we are going to implement that using our optimal mechanical phase shifters, where we can now use voltages to control these phases, thereby these coefficients for the qubit. And then there are, in principle, eight of these eight resonators in a single device. So most of the things we already understand now. And the last element that we see are the single uh, superconducting single photon detectors. So what is that? Well, the superconducting single photon detectors are devices that look like this. So they're integrated on the waveguide. And you see there is this little U-shaped thing here. And that's about 30 to 70 nanometer wide, very thin layer of niobium titanium nitride that's lying on top of this waveguide. And niobium titanium nitride is a superconductor, meaning when we cool this down and send currents through, there's a whole region where there's no voltage develops. And then, of course, if we exceed the critical current, then it becomes resistive. But what we do is we uh, apply a current in this uh, no, uh, superconducting region, and then we don't get any voltage. That's, of course, what we want. That's why we choose a superconductor. But what happens now if there's a photon traveling down this waveguide, it can be absorbed in a superconductor, momentarily breaking the superconductivity, and thereby generating a very short pulse with a duration of something like a nanosecond or so, and does that with extremely good efficiency. So, of course, I could now tell you a lot more about all these detectors, how they work, how efficient they are, and so on. But um, I think the bottom line here is that the fabrication of these superconducting detectors still works fine, even after we do this entire fabrication process of these very complex uh, looking devices, including, including the release of the phase shifters. So to conclude, so I've shown you today that uh, we have this very interesting device called the H resonator, where we have very strong electrostatic interactions. We have shown squeezing of this uh, thermal motion, and we actually have used feedback to stabilize this, uh, these things, and also to create very interesting states. Now the idea is to go to higher frequencies and also to lower temperatures to really explore this in the quantum regime, so no longer thermal motion, but zero-point motion. And also our second effort is to use uh, these age resonators also within our integrated quantum optics efforts, where we have basically shown all the different elements, superconducting single photon detectors, phase shifters, circuitry, and now the next step will be to send light, non-classical light, into these very exciting devices. And with that, I thank you for your attention. operational temperature of this detector because mm -hmm. uh, I don't know this conducting compound. Uh, what is the uh, by, um, what is the mm -hmm. uh, critical temperature of this compound? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. So uh, niobium titanium nitride is actually um, it's a superconducting material, and if you have a bulk uh, mater uh, material, depending a little bit on the composition, so of course I didn't write the stoichiometry here, depends a little bit on the, on the uh, targets that you have, uh, but then uh, you get something, I think 12 uh, Kelvin is something that is reasonable. But of course we actually work with very, very thin films, and in this case the critical temperature of the film is typically much more in the order of something like 5 Kelvin or even lower. And then uh, we still have to do this patterning, lowering it even a little bit further. So maybe you get to something like 4 Kelvin. But then we actually operate it uh, much below that. And the reason for that is that um, so what we see here are different amounts of light that we sent into the detectors and then see how many times we actually detect a photon. And then you also see this, uh, this blue data here, the DCR, that stands for dark uh, count rate. And that is basically if we don't send any light in there, we're still going to get dark counts. And the higher uh, you make the temperature, the closer you go to the critical temperature of these detectors, uh, the dark count rate typically rises exponentially if you get uh, close to the operation where you have uh, good uh, detection efficiency. So that is the reason why these experiments were done at, uh, at 1.6 Kelvin. Uh, so you mean with our detectors, or? With your transmission lines. Uh, um, 
well, so <clears throat> in our case, it is not so easy to, uh, to look at reflections. So the idea would be if the reflections are very high, we could easily measure them. If they're very low, then it is not so easy. So what we did is we actually looked at how much light, so that is how much light comes through, how much light crosses over, we added that up, and then we get uh, values that are something like 95%. And that is kind of also the limit that we can, uh, can see in terms of our reproducibility of these um, uh, of the transmissions and so on. So uh, it seems that uh, there is hardly any loss. And also from simulations, you would not expect it to propagate backwards. But that is actually something for very low light, uh, for very low back reflections would be very challenging to, uh, to measure. So, so I know that the interest to TLM is not weakening. Now it's shifted from free space optics to integrated optics. And you mm -hmm. are not the only group who is doing this. There's a lot of interest, a lot of interest. So what I don't understand about this is that there seems to me that there's a lot of problems that are not obvious how to solve with KLM. Mm -hmm. right? We need um, high quality single photon sources. Mm -hmm. We need high quality entanglement sources. You need um, to eliminate losses. And you mm -hmm. need uh, high quality memory for single photons. Mm -hmm. so all of that, we don't really know how to solve. And my question is, is there a well. map to address all of these issues and mm -hmm. sort of a practical one? Well, I mean, so I, uh, I tend to disagree with you a little bit on that. So I think for each of these things, uh, there are really people working, uh, trying to build perfect single photon sources. And of course, if you would say, where, we, where were we like 20 years ago and where are we now? I think there's really been a, a steady progress towards really making on-demand indistinguishable photon sources that you can have then many on the chip. And I mean, I'm not saying it's easy, right? But I think it is definitely something where the entire uh, community is, uh, is trying to work on, whether you use down conversion sources, whether you use quantum dots, whether you use now defects in 2D materials and so on. So there's a lot of people working in every direction on these, uh, on these topics. And uh, in that sense, um, for example, to talk about uh, loss, I mean, I think it's really a technological challenge to make very low loss waveguides for example, but I don't think there's any fundamental limitation where we say, well, we can never uh, reach this. I mean, uh, I think the first experiments are relatively easy. Going beyond that is still something that you can do in a university uh, clean room. If you want to make a full scale quantum computer, that's probably something that is going to be very challenging. And then uh, we need companies to take over there, I guess, companies like IBM and Google. Um, <clears throat> But uh, I still think there's definitely uh, a very clear idea of how to make, uh, make progress there. And as you said, there's a lot of interest in that. And that also means that there is definitely progress towards that goal. Whether or not we're going to get there, I mean, that I don't know. Come back in 20 years and ask me again. As someone not in the field, I have two very naive questions. I'm sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, first one, as you mentioned, the ref uh, change in the refractive index of, the, of your H resonator. Is it? Is mm -hmm. that uh, change high enough so, uh, to create new modes for your harmonics, which could create non-linearity, which could create the backscattering as Georgia was talking about? Is that um, yeah, so that is uh, also a very interesting question. So uh, you definitely, if you just have a single waveguide and maybe you bring it together to make a directional coupler, then everything is nice and smooth and then you don't have to care about these back reflections or absorptions. But already for these, um, for these uh, phase shifters, we had to play a few tricks. For example, we had these arms. Uh, maybe I'll just show you, uh, show you the picture uh, of it. Uh, where is it? <coughs> So of course, we already had uh, these arms here. And if you make the arms too wide, you will actually have light leaking into the arms because they also form a waveguide. And you also have this block here. And that is, of course, a big piece of dielectric material. So also there, the light would go in. And for that, we actually made a photonic crystal to prevent the light entering this block here and being lost. So already there, there is quite a bit of, uh, of engineering going on that was maybe not entirely obvious. But of course, I don't want to uh, spend too much time talking about uh, some of these engineering challenges that we, uh, that we figured out. And, uh, my second main question is related to his question. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I don't know the single photon uh, superconducting detectors. Do they work like 
bolometers are e the light is absorbed in the uh, crystal and you change the temperature or do they work like electron mm -hmm. uh, you break the Cooper pair which which is the mechanism that uh, it is actually breaking of the the Cooper pair so as um, also from a more fundamental uh, physics uh, uh, point of view, these detectors are still very interesting. So people are still trying to figure out what the exact mechanism is, how the Cooper pairs are broken, then being transferred to the lattice to break other Cooper pairs and so on. Because of course it is a single photon, meaning it has an, uh, an energy of about an electron volt. These Cooper pairs have uh, much less energy and still you need to break the superconducting in this entire wire to get uh, a big so voltage you pulse. Have a local increase in temperature? Well, I mean, so there's definitely uh, things where people say, oh, there's a hot spot, and then uh, the current uh, is actually too large. It exceeds the, the critical current of the wire plus the hot spot, and then it starts to grow a hot spot, and so on. So um, it is, people have a lot of ideas and really try to pinpoint now the exact mechanisms and so on. So I would say the, the, the global picture is pretty clear, but there's still a lot of unsolved uh, details in there. That we didn't hear about the 2D optomechanics. So, ah. say a few words about uh, what kind of materials and what mm -hmm. uh, Actually, we have, uh, so when I say 2D optomechanics, um, it basically uh, means we have two projects as well. So, one will be to use silicon nitride, which is really our favorite material. And in this case, we make drums, and not just single drums, but we make arrays of drums and more complicated uh, systems to look at really uh, coupled modes in these things, propagation of, uh, of photons. That is one. And the other thing will be to combine this now with, uh, with 2D materials such as graphene, boron nitride, uh, the, uh, the uh, transition metal dichalcoconides and so on to study the interplay between the, uh, the unique properties of these atomically thin materials and then the mechanics. So that is basically uh, in a nutshell the, the, the ideas that we have there. Sorry? Uh, most likely not. So uh, for the 2D materials we would be interested in um, a photoluminescence from defects and also to look at exciton uh, dynamics and so on. How does the polarization of light change when it passes through the integrated gratings? Um, so that's actually also a very excellent question. So um, these gratings uh, typically only work with one polarization. So um, what we have in the lab, we have our laser, tunable laser, fibers, and then we have a fiber polarization controller that we use and then uh, turn all these pedals to get the maximum transmission, meaning then the uh, electrical field is, uh, is uh, TE polarized when it hits the grating. Uh, you can also design other waveguides and other uh, gradings to make sure that you can couple to TM, but typically you only have one particular polarization that you can couple very well, the other one uh, you don't. Uh, if you really rely on uh, coupling both, then uh, probably you uh, either design this grading to be very specific or you use different uh, methods that may not be so easy to scan many of these devices, but you can use butt coupling or you can use tapered fibers and other uh, things. Um, well, actually, I think it would be higher than uh, in our case. So with the grading couplers, uh, we typically have a transmission uh, of about 10%. So we send light in here, then we see how much light we get back, and then we have something like 10%. With the butt coupling, if you have a fiber that you, uh, that you cleave and then uh, make sure that you actually hit the, the facet of a waveguide, I think you can get to something like 90% uh, at least one way. Yeah, so that, um, that means, of course, now we have, say, 200 devices on this, uh, on this chip that we can all measure. If you have to use this butt coupling, then uh, you only have a uh, number of waveguides at the edge and then basically nothing there. So it is uh, kind of convenience, I would say. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we also think of, uh, of ways to improve that because, for example, in our optomechanics work, it really depends on the signal-to-noise ratio uh, with which you can resolve this motion. Any light that you lose is going to degrade it. So to really reach, say, the uh, standard quantum limit, you cannot lose any light. And then we have to resort to different techniques. Okay. This is the last question. I guess going from free space to all photonic system, you would also mm -hmm. consider integrating your quantum emitters on the circuits as well. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Increase overall this coupling problems and so on. Yeah. If there is any work like this in, in your projects. And the second maybe mm -hmm. question is that 
this directional couplets that you showed, they are very wavelength dependent. Which mm -hmm. means that if your source has a slightly different wavelength, then all this system might you need to tune it. So is there any kind of flexibility in this? Uh, two very excellent questions. So um, let me start with the first one. So uh, we are working, and of course, not just us, a lot of people are in the field are working. So the most obvious way will be to integrate uh, things like uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion materials onto the chips, and then uh, use that to generate pairs of single photons directly where we need them. Um, that's one thing. Another project that we are working on is uh, these quantum emitters in 2D materials. It's also really exciting. Uh, so far, people have mainly been using this uh, in the context where you basically put a microscope objective and see what comes back. But there's, of course, no reason why you cannot do that uh, by placing a waveguide there. So that's definitely something that we are working on. Uh, the other thing is about the direction of couplers. Um, so um, there is dispersion. Also, I've shown you we can make them, but you actually have something like uh, a few percent where the coupling ratios are off. Is that good enough? Is it not good enough? So we are also working on, uh, on these kind of things. Uh, the, the simplest way would be to make a Max Zender interferometer with, say, a heater or a optomechanical phase shifter to kind of use that as a tunable uh, directional coupler. So yes, those are all different topics that we are working on. Thank you. So 